hey YouTube, hey YouTube, hey. So, um, I got a little bit of time off work this afternoon, so I, I'm going to talk to you about Ant-Man. I watched it again in 3D last night, and just, you know, I think it's important with these Marvel movies. And movies that, movies that have a certain hype about them. You want to try and watch them minus the hype. You want to try and watch them like a week or two later, when the excitement is sort of, you know, you've calmed, you either, you want to see it again just because you're a fan, or you're like, I want to make sure that I'm not just fanboying out here. I, I try not to be a dogmatic fan, fanboy, and like be pragmatic rather, and just sort of like call them out on whatever faults that you can see, or, you know, if, there, if something's, if there's a problem with one, I'm going to call them out on that problem. So, yeah, and that's what I'm trying to do. So, be that as it may, I'm happy to report that after watching Ant-Man for a second time, the bits that were funny were still funny. Uh, the bits that were kind of awe-inspiring were awe-inspiring. I was curious to see how the 3D would work. Um, because the way he shrinks, the way he folds in on himself, and just <laughs> that's pretty cool. And I want to see something like, honestly, in 3D, didn't really live up to my height, or my height, rather, my, up to my expectations. But um, there are a number of little cool, there are a number of little sequences. The bit where he's like floating on the bed of ants, uh, going through the trains. That was pretty cool. The bit where he's flying on top of Anthony going through the um, going through the servers as they're all blowing up. That's pretty cool. Um, so there are there are a number of like really cool bits in 3D, but not as many as you would expect. And of course, that bit where he goes in the quantum realm in the third act, that's a bit mental. Oh, by the by, complete and utter spoilers. Utter spoilers. Sci fucking light the spoiler beacons. We're going spoiler territory here. Okay, so I'm going to talk about, can I go into a bit more depth as to what I liked about Ant-Man? I don't remember if I shouted out Michael Douglas on the last video I did, but he needs it because he carries, he, well, you know, it's, not, it's not fair to say that he carries this movie, but he's really good. And you, you come out of there thinking, I want to see more of Michael Douglas. First of all, how he appears in, at the start. God damn, that's good. That's like, it's, it, 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 eh. It's like, that's some serious Benjamin Button thing that they've got. That's the best sort of CGI de-aging that we've ever seen. I'm calling it right now. It was excellent. Him, the dude who played Mitchell Carson as well, that was pretty cool. But, oh man, that, that, was, that was dope. <laughs> if you'll excuse the expression. So yeah, more of him. Also, he's a really solid, really, really engaging character. And I'd like to see him do a bit more than just be Basil Exposition. Um, he says he hasn't, he's not been signed on for any more movies, but I hope that changes because he's, you know, the same way they've like Haley Atwell probably signed on for like one or two movies, but now Marvel are just like, let's get her to do everything because we like her. She's a team player. That's cool. Hopefully they get that to happen with uh, with Michael Douglas because he's he's good in this movie. Paul Rudd obviously is fun as well. Uh, Evangeline Lilly is infinitely more likable in this than she was in the Hobbit films. But um, enough about all that. Going to go spoiler deep in. So obviously his heist, his little crew are cool with the heist and shit. Um, we feel things for Anthony. A little, he, one, as soon as he named the ant, you, one single ant, you're like, all right, this is going to be the little go-to CG creature that um, is like the buddy and everyone loves in this film or he's going to die. Sure enough, his number's up, friends. They, they, they killed that motherfucker first chance they got. That was some shot, by the way. You, you, can, you can shoot an ant with a bullet. You're like a great marksman. Although you find out that he was actually just... He was, he was pretty much just strafing there. Speaking of which, Darren Cross. So, Corey Stoll playing Darren Cross. He's like... He's kind of like Lex Luthor. In a, in a bizarro world, he's Lex Luthor. He's very... You can see they've, they've got this... The, there's this recurring theme of fathers and their legacies for their children. Fathers and daughters is, is both married with Scott and... Thank like him, um, and that's pretty cool. The little girl who plays Cassie Lang, she's just the, she's the most adorable girl you've, you've you've seen on screen in years. Like, is my daddy a bad guy? Mm, I hope you don't catch him. Ah, mm. oh, just come on. That's 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 cool. She's cool. Um, so there's that. Corey Stoll has got Corey Stoll as a yellow jacket though. The yellow jacket suit. Interesting. That fight in the suitcase. There's a okay. There's a fight in a suitcase. You don't, you're not going to get that anywhere else. There's a fight in a fucking suitcase. That was a bit mental. I enjoyed that though, and the humor was on point. Um, the Edgar Wright comparisons 
as far as I know, that like he, there's a lot of it that is still in the movie itself. Like a lot of the action sequences were there, him coming out of prison at the start. Um, that so it, it's still a, a very much an Edgar Wright movie. And there are some pe- there are some scenes that I could swear are very Edgar Wright. Like the bit where, I mean, whenever some music plays during a fight, like you know, whenever the, whenever the Cure comes on, he's like, I'm gonna disintegrate you. Playing Disintegration by the Cure on the iPhone. Love it. Great, excellent. That like that felt very Edgar Wright to me. Um, so yeah, uh, interesting. The fight with the Falcon, that was cool. I should have seen that coming. Uh, whenever they said, "Hey, I'm sending you to uh, upstate New York. It's an abandoned Stark warehouse. It's not an abandoned Stark warehouse. It's the Avengers HQ." And you're like, "Okay, things just got a bit more dicey." He infiltrates them. We have a face-to-face with the Falcon, and they have a, this cool fight where it's not number one. It actually promotes Ant-Man a bit. You're like, "Okay." This guy can handle himself. He took on an Avenger and didn't die, which is cool. Speaking of which, I want to backtrack a bit. They mentioned earlier about how, right, you know, whenever he, whenever Hank, Hank, Hank laying out the plan to him, and he just says, uh, you know, he's he's telling, him, he, he says, well, I need just we need if this, it's going to be chaos if they if he gets his hand on this tech. And he goes, I think our first move should be calling the Avengers. And obviously Hank Pym goes off on a rant and says, we're not, we're not doing that, we don't trust the Avengers. Obviously some public opinion has gone against them following Age of Ultron and things like that. And, and he himself is quite rooted against both Howard Stark and Tony Stark, it seems. Um, I like that they've actually said, hey, why don't we call the Avengers? Because that's the first time they've done that. That should be the obvious thing that they should have done in every other Marvel movie up to this between Avengers and I. There's no point in Thor The Dark World where he goes, I should call these other guys I know from that one time back in New York with that thing. You know, Captain America doesn't ring Tony Stark whenever helicarriers that were built using his technology are on the fritz. Uh, Iron Man doesn't think to reach out to S.H.I.E.L.D. or somebody else whenever his house gets blown up and he's homeless. and he's, uh, You know, so I'm glad they finally thought of that. Anyway, I'm I'm not gonna do the I'm not gonna do the post credits. I'm thinking I'm gonna do a separate video on post credits. Yeah, I will because they're they're interesting. I could fill up another few minutes on that, but I'm gonna focus on the movie itself because the post credits aren't strictly part of the movie to me. They're their own little thing. Uh, let me see what else. Janet Van Dyne, the Wasp, the original Wasp. We get to see her in a flashback. We see what happened to her. It's pretty heartbreaking, and it leads to one in the, one of the most touching moments between Evangeline, Evangeline Lilly and Michael Douglas. They're, they're characters. They're great. And then Paul Rudd's a solid guy, but he kind of he spoils that moment. But he, at the same time, he gives it that nice little levity. It's very Whedon-esque. I liked it. Very impressive. Very impressive scenes there. Um, Corey Stoll going mad. They quick, like there was a bit of exposition where like this is new. It's the pen particles. They're affecting your brain. Blah! And it does say, you know, they say it's taking a toll on me. So I'm wondering if they're going to address that if they ever give us an Atman too. You know, it's kind of weird that they haven't announced one already. But obviously we've seen the Marvel slate going right off through to the end of Phase Three, and it's it's kind of chock a block. We know he's going to appear in, in Civil War. That's cool. No word on whether or not the Wasp will, will. But I think it's it's one of the strengths in this movie in that. Number one, the humour there is so engaging that that can that can lift this movie. It, it's it's almost its secret weapon. It's funnier than you would think it would be, but it's also got a lot more heart than you would imagine it would. And it's a pretty cool heist movie with a with a giant with a miniature keychain tank. That's just a, actually a tank, as it happens, and ants, lots of fucking ants. Um, so yeah, I mean, I I, I liked it a lot. I watched it again, and you know. Every, all the bits that made me chuckle the first time made me chuckle again the second time, which is always good. Let's talk about what happened when we went into the quantum realm, though, okay? Some, I'd heard it between my first and second viewing that you can see somebody in there, and I wasn't sure, but then I watched it again, and sure enough, whenever he goes into the quantum realm, I've got a bug on me. It's a spider. I'm doing weird, though. Anyway, um, yeah, whenever he goes into the quantum realm, sure enough, you can see a silhouette. It look, people are like, it's got wings. And it's like, it's got a cloak. It's Doctor Strange. But like, you can see a silhouette. You can see a human-like silhouette with like head, shoulders, arms. That's what you can make out. It's in like the top right-hand corner of the screen. If you're going to watch it again, watch it again. Keep your eyes peeled. It's very quick, but it's pretty distinct when you check it out. So 
Yeah, there's that. Also, that was trippy as fuck, man. That was like, that was 2001 Space Odyssey. Right, like, I'm glad they pushed the envelope for that. Whenever you see him going through the dust particles, and the dust mites, and they go smaller and smaller and smaller. I also love the concept of that. I, you know, the dangers of shrinking are you can, you know, there's only so small you can shrink before you start to shrink for all eternity. I will say that him getting out of the quantum realm was very contrived to me. It was kind of like, don't mess with the regulator, otherwise you'll shrink for all eternity. How did he get out of it? He swaps the regulator, and he unshrinks. Shouldn't he then grow for all eternity? I don't, I don't know. What? Um, I, yeah. Anyway, like I said, there's, I'm just, I'm jumping all over the place here. Um, we get a little Spider-Man shout out. Did you hear that? Like right at the end, like one of the, during that weird sort of lip syncing, sort of Chinese whispers segment that uh, Michael Peña's character, Luis, is going on about. One of the, the women in it is like, we got a guy who can swing. We got a guy who can crawl up walls. I'm like, ah, ah. So that's it. That's a little shout out. I thought it was going to be like, I'd heard there was a Spider-Man reference in this. I thought it might be like Oscorp or something. No, it's just, it's, it's straight up Spider-Man, man. And why the fuck not? So, yeah. Uh, you know, what about... The mark of a good movie. I mean, there are, there's a lot of good... There's a lot of things that I weigh a movie against. In terms of... A great movie is a movie that stays with you for days afterwards. That just grips you and haunts you. And you're like, you just can't stop thinking about it. Another mark of a good movie for me is... You know, if you come out of that film thinking, I want to see those guys again. I want to see them get together. I want to see these characters. I want to see what their next adventure is. And I feel that way for pretty much everyone in Ant-Man, except for the three guys that were in his little heist club. Those three wombats, as Michael Douglas called them. What the fuck is that? What? That's, what? Wombats? That's not even a... Anyway, well... Those are my Ant-Man thoughts. If you liked this vid, please click like, subscribe, view, share, and all the usual jazz. If I missed anything, I'm sorry. Please shout it out in the comments below. And yeah, see you later.